kitchen. The thing about pride is you never see it coming. You always think that you're in a good place until you realize you're off the deep end. Um, okay, so we've been looking at, Bess has been talking about how our mouths, a very important topic. Um, you, you know, we, we like gossiping, and I think a, a large part of why we like it is because we like to feel superior over other people. We, we like to feel like, you know, we've got our act together and everybody else is messing up, and uh, gossip really fits that bill very nicely. Um, so, uh, Pastor's been talking about um, our mouths on Sunday morning. Um, highly encourage you to check into that. If you've missed any of it, I would highly recommend you going back and listening to it. Um, if you do not have internet, the library does, so there's that. Um, besides that, uh, we also have it where, I mean, if, if you can't get a hold of it anywhere else, you come to my house, I'll put it on the TV for you to watch. Okay. It, was, it was worth watching. Um, and, uh, but he'll be on part four uh, this Sunday morning, this coming Sunday morning. Um, on Wednesdays, we, ha we, uh, we have going deeper. We just look at things a little bit more in-depth than we do on Sundays. I highly encourage you to go to that. Okay, so uh, we've been looking at seek, give, pray, go. These four commands that Jesus gives throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and uh, well, we'll go more in-depth in them in just a second. But first, Michael De DeMontaigne once said, My life has been filled with terrible misfortune. Most of which never happened. In a recent uh, study that, w that made its appearance, I believe it was on, in the New York Times, it said that 85% of what we worry about never happens. 85%. And then it gets even less than that, okay? Because the things that do happen aren't as bad as imagined. Of the 100% of things that we worry about, there's only about 4% of it that actually ever happens. Imagine that. I mean, I, found, I find that just crazy. And it gets worse because I was reading in another study done by actually doctors. Okay, I'm not making this up. Um, and they did a series of different tests based on, on stress and worry. Worry causes ulcers, which can cause many other problems, such as stomach cancer, but not necessarily. Um, it causes your brain to literally shrink literally shrink. When you worry, you literally become less intelligent and your brain be, is not able to handle the same amount of uh, input as it once was able to. Not only that, but your, your brain is amazing. They, they've actually found out that your brain is, throughout the entire span of your life, no matter how old you get, your brain is always being rewritten. What that means is that you can write your brain as to what to, what to understand. In other words, if I train my brain to worry about something, then my brain will automatically worry about it without me having to tell it to because that's how I've trained it to. So then what happens, okay, is your brain is basically a supercomputer. So it does what you tell it to do plus some. So in other words, if you train your brain to worry, it won't just worry, you will then start analyzing and critiquing every situation you're in and pulling out the worst case scenario in every single situation you're in. Crazy, right? But here's the good news. Now, as you get older, your brain, it takes longer for it to learn stuff. It, it, it doesn't write those same neural pathways as it did when you were younger, but this is what they found out. You're never too old to start working on it. Your brain is always that plastic that you can mold it. So what I'm getting at here is it's never too late to stop worrying. So obviously since we're, well, let me go through a couple other things that worry causes. Um, lower intelligence, I mentioned that. Heart disease. Oh boy, heart disease. Cancer, depression, Alzheimer's, many other things. But yes, did you know that Alzheimer's can be brought on by a lifestyle of worry? That is mind-blowing to me. You can, you can just completely destroy your mental health and physical health too just by worrying about stuff. So now that I've given you guys a bunch of stuff to worry about, <laughs> I can recall personally many times of worrying so much that it actually affected my life. You know, when you're up at night and you're, you're, you're waking up throughout the night, and I'm sure you have too. Maybe, I, I don't know if we worry about the same stuff, but maybe you worry about your kids. 
Uh, maybe you worry about your work. Man, John's shaking his head. He's like, I don't have kids. I don't worry about them. <laughs> uh, maybe you worry about, uh, about your work. Maybe you worry about world news. Uh, I know a lot of people, a lot of people stay up and, and, and just worry about that. They, they worry about where is, our, where is our government headed. They, they worry about um, maybe um, a lot of people are worried about climate change. Um, maybe you're worried about um, the economy. I mean, there's a lot of different things that people are worried about. And whatever it is, you know, for you, it, uh, it takes away from your joy in life, and it really just causes you to get in a place where, I mean, you just get to be a little bit of a negative person. Um, you know, one thing that I was thinking about is, you know, when you get sick, I, I got sick one time. That real bad. I mean, I've been sick before, but this time I was actually hospitalized. I mean, actual sick. I'm not talking about a cold. Colds or whatever, you know, you get over them in a couple weeks. Uh, flus or whatever, but this I was the time I was actually sick. I was hospitalized, and I actually almost died. Funny story. My mom wouldn't even take pictures of it because she was concerned that that would be the last picture she'd have of me. <laughs> oh, my goodness. So, anyways, um, um, well, that's kind of a rabbit trail. Let's get back on track. Okay, so just a, a recap of what we've been looking at. Uh, three weeks ago, we looked at the first command, the seek part of the seek, give, pray, go. Um, it was earlier in Matthew 6 or somewhere around there. Uh, and it basically says, seek God's kingdom more than anything. Okay. All right. Then, uh, two, uh, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, we looked at the second command, which is give. And uh, the disciples are talking to Jesus, and they say, hey, send these people away so they can go get some food. And he says, no, no, no. You give them something. And... Uh, uh, so give them something. Give people something. Don't, don't live your life just for yourself all the time. Give people something. And then last week we looked at um, really just the purpose that Jesus had in life. We talked about the life cycle of a church and a typical Christian or actually how there's also the same signs of physical life and death. Um, and we were talking about how Jesus, everything that he did and said, it just he had a purpose in the things. That he, you know, he didn't just talk. You know, Jesus didn't just get bored and, and talk so he could hear himself talk. Everything he did, even the seemingly pointless things that he said, or the things that don't really seem to fit into what he's talking about, he said them for a specific reason, knowing, knowing that thousands of years later, people would still be reading and analyzing and still finding new stuff. That blows my mind away. You talk about uh, leaders with foresight. Jesus was a heck of a good leader, and he had some amazing foresight. So anyways, you must do all things with purpose and vision. Don't just do things. You know, do them with purpose. Have a vision for your life. No. Um, so that takes us to this one. So seek, uh, seek God's kingdom. Give them something. Pray. This is the third command. Uh, next week we'll finish up the series. But this command is found in Matthew chapter uh, 26. Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse uh, 36. And we'll go down to 41. It says... Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee and began to be grieved and distressed. Excuse me. Then he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour. Um, keep, by the way, um, the word there, men, is not actually in the Greek. He's not, he's not using it sarcastically. So you men, it's, it actually just says, So you could not keep watch with me. They inserted men just to kind of add flow. I don't want you to think that Jesus is being sarcastic here when he's not. Um, so you people could not keep, uh, keep watch with me for one hour. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And we're going to go ahead and stop there. Now, if you know this story at all, Jesus, this is Jesus' last night. He's getting ready to be arrested, uh, falsely charged, and killed, and then he'll rise up again on Sunday. Um, so, let's look at that. The third command, watch and pray. Now, if you're at all keeping an eye on things, you probably are aware of the fact that prayer isn't necessarily highlighted so much anymore. And uh, people kind of go to extremes with it. 
And uh, let me let me build on that before we get there. So, okay, we've got prayer. This is the third thing. See, give, pray, go. So what happens if you have prayer, but you don't combine it with the seeking God's kingdom or the giving them something? Well, what happens if you just take prayer apart from those things, apart from living with purpose, apart from those things? If you, see, if you pray without seeking God's kingdom, it, you find yourself praying cute and ultimately pointless prayers. I, I'll give you a couple examples. Um, maybe a prayer like this, God help me to get good sleep, amen. I mean, that, that's fine, you know, to teach a kid and stuff, that, that kind of stuff. Or maybe if you're really having a hard time sleeping at night, pray, hey, okay, all right. But I'm talking about when, when you just do your little nighttime routine of, okay, God, good night. You know, it's like, there's no depth to that. It's, it's just kind of a pointless prayer. Uh, another one that, that, that we really make important uh, maybe maybe praying for food, and that's the highlight of your prayer life, is praying for your food. That shouldn't be the highlight of your prayer. <laughs> so, okay, well, that's what happens if you, see, if you pray without seeking God's kingdom. You really just have a pointless prayer. If you pray without giving, without giving of yourself, of your money, of your time, you find yourself giving insincere prayers. And I'll give you an example of this. God, I pray that you would help the orphans. Well, why don't you help them? Because uh, I'm praying that you would do something, God. See what I mean? It's an insincere prayer. I can pray that God will do something about the druggies in Tularosa, but if I don't actually give of something of me, see what I mean? It's an insincere prayer because I'm not willing to do something about it. Now, there is a difference between insincerity, insincerity in your prayer and patience in your prayer. Those are two different things. Patience says... God, you're doing something, and I'm willing when, if you say go, if you say give, I'm willing. And I'm waiting. I'm waiting on you. I'm not jumping the gun. I'm waiting on you. Insincere is this. God, you do something about the druggies, or you go send somebody else to do something about the druggies. I don't want to give of my time. I don't want to give of my money. You just go use somebody else. A good example of this would maybe be Moses when he says, can't you just send someone else? <laughs> Maybe that's a good a good example. So if you give, if you pray without seeking, it's mainly a pointless prayer. If you if you seek uh, a pray without giving, you have an insincere prayer. If you pray without going, you have a very shallow prayer. See, because big dreams come from prayers with God, where you get alone with God and He tells you something that you didn't know. And then he tells you to do something that you've never done. Big dreams are born from prayers. But if you don't have praying with the willing spirit to go, you ultimately have a shallow prayer. Because you're saying, God, I want more of you, but then you're not actually showing him that you want more. God, speak to me in better ways. I'm not going to read your Bible. But speak to me in better ways. Use me to change Tolerosa. You can't even use me to pay my ties, to give people encouragement, to, to follow behind people and encourage them as they do their ministries. You, you can't count on me for any of that, but you can count on me to do some big thing off in the distance. See, that, that, that doesn't really fit. We all want to be the superheroes in our stories, but the truth is none of us are the superheroes. God is a superhero. He just chooses to use us. See, there's a big difference there. We're, we're, not, we're not the center stage of the story. And uh, Sometimes God uses us to do these really big things, and sometimes he doesn't. And you know what? That's okay. Because we don't have to be the center of attention. Okay? So, it's necessary that you combine all four of these commands. Seek, give, pray, go into one. Now, it, you might be wondering, what about go? What's going on there? We'll get to it next week, okay? So, if you're at all familiar with, familiar with, with prayer and, and, and that kind of stuff, you know that it's kind of looked down on. Uh, in popular culture, you know, by the media, that kind of stuff. Um, okay, so you pray and send out good thoughts, but why don't you do something to help? And there is actually a, a good point in that. When you say that you care, but you're unwilling to lift a finger, say what I mean? I think for too long, the church has been trying to stick its finger in politics. We need to get more more laws passed, more more of this, da 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 And instead of doing that, we should have been reaching out to people. Politicians are corrupt. 
You just have to face that. Let them do whatever corrupt things they're going to do. We, as God's body, have to be his hands and feet in the community. See what I mean? We don't need to wait for the government to give a handout to the druggies. We, as a church, should have been doing something 50 years ago when the drug epidemic first started. But for whatever reason, we decided to turn our eyes because we didn't want them. They were the rough crowd. And so here we are in 2019. It's gone way out of control. And the church is still scratching its head like, well, gee, I don't know. Should we do something about it? Well, gee, I don't know. Should we? <laughs> you, you know what I mean? This is, there was actually a, a time in history when um, China was trading, and we pretty much forced them to take opium. <laughs> and their people were getting very addicted to it. So the government said, okay, we're just not going to really trade with opium anymore. And, uh, and our government said, no, you are going to do it, and that's just how this is going to go. And the opium uh, addiction got so bad in China, they were, I mean, everybody was addicted to it in the, in the, in the emperor's court and everything. And uh, it was just the whole big thing. And uh, anyways, it, kind of the same idea there. So this is just an example. We have this guy here watering his, his plant. And this guy here is on fire. And he says, my thoughts and prayers are with you. You, you, you kind of get the point. <laughs> Sometimes uh, atheists, for instance, make fun of people like us because we pray but do nothing. And that's true. That, that is not a good point. That is not a good thing. But then there's also the danger of going to the other extreme, and that's exempting prayer from our life. You know what we do as Christians? We sometimes do this thing that sounds real good. It's called fake praying. This is where you don't actually pray. There's no conversation going on. You're not listening to God. Every day you get up and you grab and complain. And then you ask God to give you what he already told you no, and then you go on your merry way. And you repeat this little cycle day after day after day with no actual interaction going on between you and God. In essence, you're talking to yourself. Because God already gave you an answer, and you didn't listen. Because you don't actually ask God for his input. Because you're not actually listening to him when he's talking. It's just words. It's fake praying. We convince ourselves, no, I've got a good, strong prayer life going on. But if you were to stop and ask, so what's actually going on in that prayer life? Well, I complain about this that's happening. I gossip to God about this person because he needs to change them. Uh, and then I go to work, and then when I'm done, done with work, I get back and I, and I complain to God about how unfair my boss is. And that, that's not praying. That's complaining and gossiping. Do you honestly think that God wants to be our sounding board? <laughs> He wants us to, to see past where we are, to see into the future of what he could do in the Southwest. He doesn't want us to get tangled up in, in useless complaining. I mean, that, that doesn't profit anybody anything. So Martin Luther uh, actually said this, uh, Martin Luther King Jr., I believe, not Martin Luther, separated by a couple hundred years. Uh, <laughs> he said, to be a Christian without prayer is no more possible than to be alive without breathing. But somewhere along the line as Christians, we've forgotten how to pray. We've forgotten to ask God for the impossible. And instead, we've changed the gospel into a social message. And that's all it is. See, God is love, but love isn't God. Do you understand the difference? If love is God, then that means new age is right. If God is love, then that's absolutely different. See, we don't need to show people love while neglecting the good news, we need to show them love because it complements the good news. They're connected. We treat people with love and we show them Christ. We don't show them love so that we can share the gospel just as like a hidden motive kind of thing. No, no, we actually do love people. But then we don't neglect the gospel. You see the difference? Does that kind of make sense? It, 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 it's, it's something where as Christians we have to be okay with telling people, you know what, I am a little bit dependent on something. It's called Jesus. We have to be okay with that. There was an Andre Crouch song a long time ago, which I, I don't know if anybody here remembers him. But if you do, it says, where would I be if Jesus didn't love me? But still, you have to just love Jesus' purpose and everything that he does. You know what I do as a leader? I get hurt.
hurt, and I say, you know what, I got this one, it's okay. I can make it, I'm fine. And then something else happens. So then I have like this, this running total of disappointments, of dreams dying, of people dying, of people betraying me, just this long list of disappointments in my life. And I honestly think that there's not a person here who doesn't do that. <laughs> we just, we sometimes feel a little sidetracked. But Jesus, no, not Jesus. Jesus just stays so on point with things. He's, he, he's got his act together. You know, I, I went to a church once. The pastor didn't trust anybody. He never took risks. He just did the same thing every single week. But you know, life is really all about risks. When you get married, that's a risk. When you get a job, that's a risk. I mean, life is all about risks. Even as a Christian, it's still all about risks. This pastor always had the sins of others forefront in his mind, and it caused him to be unable to make a decision for the future because he was always remembering the past. That's where I would be if I was a senior pastor. But here we have Jesus. Just blows me away, this guy. Just everything that he does is just so amazing. If you just stop to analyze it and think, wow. So let's look back here. It, um, it says Jesus came to a place called Gethsemane. He goes there to pray. He tells his disciples, except for three, you guys just stay there, I'm gonna go with these three. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. They go on um, and began to be grieved and distressed, okay? Verse 38, then he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and, and keep watch with me. So then we get to verse 39, which is just amazing, guys. This, this verse is amazing. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Wow. He never once said, look at all these people who are betraying me. Look at how unfair my ministry has been. Look at how my own people hate me. Look at how my mom and my brothers didn't support me in my ministry. Look at how everything for me has always been an uphill fight. I've never had it easy my whole life. He doesn't say any of those things. That is amazing. He's about to die, for goodness sake. And this is what he has to say. My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Wow. Wow. Jesus didn't keep a running tab of everything wrong that had happened. He didn't keep a tab of everyone who was against him <laughs> or who betrayed him. You know, at this very moment, as he's praying this, Judas is off selling him. At this very moment that he's praying, and Jesus knew it because he said, go and do what you plan to do. Wow. And he's not even complaining about the people who betrayed him. This is just mind-blowing. Have you ever been betrayed? How many weeks did you spend worrying about it and whining about it? Maybe you're still worrying and whining about it. This is the same night. I'd say it was a little fresh in his mind. This is amazing. So then it goes on in this amazing person named Jesus. He just keeps going. Verses 40 through 41. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping and said to Peter, So, so you could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. So there's the first thing. Jesus didn't keep track of all the wrongs, of all the things that, 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 man, that is amazing. You know, we could all learn something from Jesus. And so then we get here to this verse here, verses 40 through 41. A failure is not the end. Get up and try again. Did he go to his disciples and say this? You messed up. No, this is what he says, verse 41. Keep watching and praying. That is amazing to me. He could have rubbed their noses in. You know what I do when I'm stressed? You know, I do when I'm having a rough time. I take it out on other people. Do you ever take it out on other people? Did you ever do that? Jesus didn't do that. That is mind-blowing to me. He gets to prayer. He doesn't whine about the situation. And then, P 
people fail him and they can't even keep awake to help him in his moment of need. He was with them, pouring into them all of his three year and a half years of ministry, and they couldn't keep up for a few hours. And yet, he's, he doesn't chew them out. He, he doesn't chew them out. A failure is not the end. Get up and try again. Wow, it just amazes me. So then he says this other thing. He says this, also in verse 41. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And I will say this. Often our failure or victory is decided before the battle begins. Often our victories or our failures are decided before the battle ever began. You might say, okay, I, I understand what you're saying, but I don't really get that. Well, see, when we're watching and praying, we're paying attention. For instance, let's say I have a pornography problem. And let's say I know that I'm going to be home alone today with internet activity. Are you seeing the, see the connection? I've already lost the battle. I'm not even there yet. I didn't take steps for the battle that was coming up. So then when it came, I fell to it. See, you see? Oftentimes we fall or have, we have victory or defeat in a battle before we even ever get to the battle. Another example, um, you know, I wish that I would remember this. I don't know, maybe you guys don't do this. Maybe I'm the only person who does this. But when I'm physically ill, I pull back a little bit from God. What I mean by that is when I'm throwing up in the toilet, I really just don't feel like praying. Maybe it's just me. I don't know. Now, when you have prolonged sickness, like for instance, I was talking about when I was hospitalized, that was a prolonged sickness. I was not reading my Bible and I was not praying. Not because I couldn't, just because I was just blah. Maybe if you've ever gone through a lengthy thing that you can't ever seem to get over, maybe you know what I'm talking about. You just, praying and, praying and reading your Bible doesn't seem that important at the time. You just kind of want to lay around. See, you aren't preparing yourself for the battle, so you already have doomed yourself to failure. See, you see where I'm going with this? So let, let's keep plowing through here. Sometimes we aren't used in gifts because our attitude stinks, because we aren't seeking God. Sometimes we ask, God, oh, why aren't you using me um, in a gift or a ministry or whatever? How come nothing I'm doing seems to go right? How come when I'm doing this ministry, it seems like it just keeps falling apart? You have to ask yourself, am I seeking God on this? Maybe it wasn't God's will for you to do that thing. Maybe it was, but you won't know if you're not if you don't have a developed prayer life. You won't be able to tell. See, if you are supposed to do something and you face struggles and you're not praying, you're gonna think, oh, God's not in it because I'm facing struggles, so I'm gonna give up. If you start having problems and you weren't supposed to have been in it, you aren't gonna know because you're not praying. You see the difference? It doesn't matter what, what the result is. You still need prayer in the process. So let's keep going. Uh, verse 41, I'm just going to read the whole verse again. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Spiritual desire is often met with physical weakness, with temptations, and with sickness. Count on it. When you want to do something in your spirit, you're just... Man, you're really gung-ho. You're going to find yourself being more tired. For instance, when you start fasting, and all of a sudden you crave the very thing that you're fasting from. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. That's kind of a cycle in our lives. Whenever you find that your spirit is real gung-ho, keep watch. Keep watch, because your flesh is going, to, is going to go the other way. Bank on it. When you get ready to do something real, real gung-ho for God, and you're like, Man, I'm having a bunch of bad attitudes surface all of a sudden. Well, gee, I wonder why. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Staying in prayer prepares you for life. If you're not in prayer, you will not be prepared for life. Things will happen that you aren't prepared for. And they'll happen even if you're in prayer. But if you're in prayer, you'll be able to bend with them. The betrayals, the lies... The nonsense. You know what Jesus did after he had victories in his ministry? He got alone and prayed. You know what we do when we have victories in our ministry? 
We go and tell people about it. We go and brag. We feel just invincible, so we start posting stuff online looking for fights. We're like, man, who wants to fight me? I'm God's main warrior. I'll take y'all out. You, you know, and we just get, just get all puffed up. Or what happens when we're getting ready for a victory? We worry about it. Do you know what Jesus did when he was getting ready for the fight? He prayed about it. Here we have Jesus the night of his death. I'd say this is a big battle coming up. And what is he doing, wasting his time? He's wasting his time praying. He could have wasted his time worrying. But instead, he decided, no, I'm going to go to prayer. This guy, man, this guy, he just, everything he does, you just might want to pay attention to it. If Jesus did it, just, I want to pay attention to it. You may want to do the right thing, but without prayer, you are setting yourself up for failure. Even if you want to do the right thing, if you're not in prayer, you're setting yourself up for failure. It won't, it won't work. It won't work. Or it'll work for a little bit, just long enough for you to get yourself head over heels in it, and then you'll be stuck in mud trying to get out. Have you ever, have you ever gotten one of those fancy 4x4s four four stuck in real deep mud? Oh, I can get her out of anything. And then you get there and you're like, oh, I'm stuck. So then you need another guy with this big 4x4 four four and you're pushing each other and you're like, oh, now we're both stuck. And then finally, some genius with a wench gets there, thank God, and he pulls you both out. Have you ever, you never had that happen? Okay. Well. You see this happen, we were actually talking about it just this week. College grads trying to fix the whole world. So they graduate and, and they go out into social care and they, they try to do everything, but then they get burnt out, burn out real bad. Because in, in their little fantasy college world, they were the single player in, in the team that was entitled me. They could do anything because their professor said they wrote a good paper. So then they get out into the real world and it's like, dang, this is hard. It's hard to do, go back to the same thing every single day, guys. That's hard. We are invested in, 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 in Tularosa and the Otero County and in, 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 in the Southwest. We're invested in this area. As pastors, you really have to be or else you'd probably move on. I mean, you really have to be invested in what you're doing. But with that being said, did you know that the Tularosa Basin isn't real known for changing real quick? Did, did you know that? We don't really have a reputation around these here parts for correcting our errors too quickly. <laughs> we kind of like to be drugged by the mouth with a hook. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> more could be said there. But anyways, um, without prayer, you're setting yourself up for failure. And I'm not trying to make light of, you know, doing social work or anything like that. You know, more power to you. But without prayer, you're setting yourself up for failure. Every pastor, I'll give you an example, and I think you'll all be able to relate, relate to this. Every pastor goes through phases of his life. The first phase, his calling. He's on fire. He wants to do it yesterday. Then the preparation. These people, they just keep telling me things in this Bible class or whatever. I, I don't need to know all this stuff. It's pointless. I got it. I know more than them anyways. Then there's the honeymoon phase. This is where they actually get a ministry. And they get going on, and man, they're gung-ho. They want to change everything as soon as they get to the church. Change that and that and that and that and that and that. Well, obviously, the older people are going to have a problem with that. <laughs> I mean, hello. You don't want to hire a young pastor just to see him come in and change everything. And so then, there's this, after the honeymoon phase, there's this dark phase that pastors go through where they just want to quit. Go somewhere where it's a little bit more exciting. Go somewhere where there's less, op less opposition. Go somewhere where, just get out of there, something. But then if they stick past that phase, there's this wonderful phase of more heartache. But unlike the previous heartache, this heartache, it's different. It hurts still, but somewhere in your heart, you know that you're gonna make it. And eventually you get to this place of thinking, you know, all ministry is is going from problem to problem. If I'm not in a problem, I'm getting ready for the next one. But then if you make it past that, there's yet another stage of joy. When you realize changing the world isn't about you doing it all by yourself. It's about God doing his thing. And then you realize those little things you do actually are important. It might not seem important to people who run these, you know, Fortune 500 or 400 or whatever companies, but in the real world, they are important. 
because you were helping little people with their little lives, like the food pantry. We're not, we're not giving food to lords of Washington, D.C. We're, we're giving to just little people, just like us. And that's okay. That's changing the world. And so you get to this place of ministry where you actually get to have joy. Because your value as a minister isn't based off of what people think of you. That's an amazing place to be at. Because you realize that God can use anyone. And that's okay. So we're just going to go to a few little things here, finalizing this sucker up. Being disturbed by something is normal. Sometimes we're told by these super religious people on television that if you have doubts in your life, you're a bad Christian. Oh, you're such a bad Christian. Uh, you know, if, if, if you had a flutter of doubt, if, if you're struggling in your faith, then you're just a sinner. Well, actually, if you read the actual Bible rather than their version of the Bible, look at what it says here. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, this is verse 37, and began to be grieved and distressed. Jesus was distressed. Jesus was grieved. Jesus was going through a battle here. You don't need to make it some super spiritual thing where anytime you have a doubt in your faith that you're the world's first Christian. What did Jesus do in that moment of serious anguish spiritually? He took it to prayer. He took it to prayer. Ministry isn't going from problem to problem. Ministry has problems, but it also has joy. I mean, if you look at, want to look at it as going from problem to problem, it could just as easily be said you're going from uh, good news to good news. Sometimes it might seem like the good news is more spread apart than the bad news, but it's still there. See, it's all about our, our attitude. Going back to what I said at the beginning with our brain. What are you training your brain to look for? Your brain can find the things to be thankful for if you train it to. So here's your little test. This week, I want you to think about people who you have a problem with. Can you think of anything good about them? The problem's you. The problem's you. If you just sit there at the picking people and you found all their bad sides and everything that they're doing wrong, the problem's you. You've trained yourself to look at the wrong, and now you're looking at the wrong. This week, I want you to go to these situations that are bothering you and, and the problems that you think you're never going to get out of. Or maybe you think that it's just taking too long, whatever. And I want you to try and find the good side of it. And if you can't find the good side of it, the problem is you. Luckily, there's a cure. It's called prayer. Being disturbed by something is normal, but you must use that as a motivation to pray, even if you pray alone. Even if you pray alone. If you don't pray about it, you will worry, you will stress, you will try and fix it, and you will fail to trust God. That's what will happen. It's a very predictable pattern, and every time you see people do it, they always say the same thing. I don't know how I got here. Little baby steps. Little baby steps. That's how we always get to where we are. The, right, the Bible says that the righteous will live by faith, even if struggling. Living by faith isn't never having a doubt, isn't never having a problem, isn't never having a struggle. Living by faith is taking those doubts and struggles to God in prayer and leaning on Him. If there was never a problem that distressed you, that just means you don't love people. It's easy to not care about someone if you don't love them. Oh, hey, they, they have cancer and they're dying. Oh, well. Of course it's going to bother you. Unless you don't care, which is not a good thing. Research shows that worry trains our minds how to deal with it. And it also trains our minds what to look for. I already talked about that. A simple way you can pray. Oops. Worry trains your mind to worry. I already talked about that. A simple ways you can pray. Just a few simple prayers here, okay? God, use me to impact those around me. Maybe you have a neighbor, for instance. Maybe, you know, uh, I know Chuck was talking to me a couple weeks ago. Um, you know he's in the process of getting a motorcycle where he can drive it around and stuff. 
um, and he was, was talking to me about uh, potentially uh, doing like maybe chaplain stuff at the hospital or something like that. That's just an example of, of what you can do. Just use me some way, God. Maybe you don't have to do something as big. Maybe you can do something bigger. I don't know. Now, here's another prayer you can pray. Use me to help those in similar situations. You know what we do when we go through a bad situation? We try and hide it from the world. When you go through anxiety, you don't want to talk to people about anxiety. When you go through depression, you don't want to talk to people about depression. When you go through pornography, you don't want to talk to people about pornography. When you lose a child, you don't want to talk to people about losing, child, losing your child. You don't want to talk about that. But you'd be surprised how God uses those very ugly things for very good outcomes. You'd be surprised. Here's a, just one more example since this is a very common issue. Raising grandchildren. You know, raising grandchildren is a lot like adoption. Don't ever, ever, ever lie to yourself and say that raising your grandchildren isn't important. Don't ever lie to yourself. You're doing God's work. It might not be under the label of adoption. Maybe CYFD isn't involved. But you're still adopting. You're still doing a good turn. Don't complain about it. Pray about it. Because God has you exactly where he wants you. And I can guarantee you that he has your grandkids exactly where he wants them to. It's just a good example. But those two prayers, I think, are a good starting place. Use me to impact those around me and use me to help those in similar situations. We'll go ahead and stop there. Um, for those of